Hello everyone, this is Sirius Trivia and today we're continuing our Fall of the Han lore series with episode 11 titled A New Rebellion in the West. Now we wrapped up with the Yellow Turban Rebellion yesterday and while that rebellion is the major focus of the Mandate of Heaven DLC and many other Three Kingdoms games like Dynasty Warriors, the Leon Rebellion that happened in the same year was in fact more impactful to ending the Han Dynasty. So while the game doesn't give this rebellion any justice, we're gonna wrap up this lore series here with a few episodes devoted to this rebellion. So we ended our last episode yesterday talking about how the celebratory mood in the capital soured when news broke out of a new rebellion out west. At first, most were not worried, as town rebellions happened all the time, and never amounted to much. But soon, news of death of the town lieutenant, followed by news of Jincheng being taken, started to make people nervous. But for us to understand this rebellion better, we need to remove ourselves from the imperial court in the capital and head to the Liang province to find the source of this rebellion. Officially, the Liang Rebellion kicked off in November of 184, as the Yellow Turbans were on their last breath. And this rebellion was started by two men named Bei Gong Bo Yu and Li Wenhou. Now these two men were what was called Huang Zhong Yi Cong, which means they were auxilia from the area of Huang Zhong. And Huang Zhong was the region within the Western Qiang territories, slightly west of Jincheng. And Yi Cong meant auxilia, which I know is a word not everyone's familiar with. It's a Latin word that means foreign troops that supported the Roman legionnaires, or basically foreign troops that served under your banner. And in the case of the Han army, it meant troops recruited from these friendly nomadic tribes that were conscripted to serve for the Han forces on its western frontiers. And if you look at the composition of the entire Han Western forces within the Liang province, auxilia units actually made up the bulk of the fighting force. Then following it in numbers are criminals from the interior commanderies who were given a second chance to amend for their wrongdoings by serving out their sentence in the military on the frontier where no one really wanted to go. Then you had the rotations of actual Han regular troops from the interior commanderies that served tours in the Liang province as the way to keep the interior troops battle ready and to keep the knives sharp. Lastly, a small group of local cavalry forces that sourced from the six horse pastures within the Liang province. Now you might think that the Han cavalry forces here should be great in number, but in reality, Many of the war horses raised here by the six government sanctioned horse pastures are shipped to the interior where they armed most of the Han Imperial Army and other forces in the interior commanderies. And the Han army stationed out here in the Liang province relied mostly on auxiliary cavalry from the nomadic tribes for support and they tend to be better trained than the Han forces in the first place. And since auxiliaries made up such a big portion of the Han forces here, we also need to mention that there are actually two different forms of auxiliary for the Han army. One form is Yi Cong, which is what Bei Gong Bo Yu and Li Wenhou belong to, and these are auxiliary units with the Han commander. And the other form is called Gui Cong, which are auxiliary units with foreign commanders. Now, when we were last talking about the three Mings of Liang, we discussed how Zhang Huan liked to use nomadic tribes against one another in his tactics, and Gui Cong, or foreign units with foreign commanders, was his preferred style, as it was easier to negotiate surrenders with nomadic tribes using Gui Cong, since they obviously preferred to have their own people as their commanders rather than some bossy, condescending Han commander. However, when Duan Jiong took over as the Qiang lieutenant later on, this policy shifted dramatically as Duan Jiong was ultra hawkish and wanted to eliminate the Qiang population entirely. So he only would allow Yi Cong, where he would provide the surrendered nomadic tribes with a Han commander of his choice. And not only did he give them a Han commander to follow, he also sent these units out on the most dangerous assignments and often used them as fodder on the battlefield. In many of his month-long campaigns, he would often return without any of the auxiliary units he left with, while his Han regulars took very few casualties. And this policy stuck, 
after Duan Jun was promoted to a cushy job in the capital, as many of his subordinates stayed behind in the Liang province in key post. So because of this enduring policy of using only Yi Cong, auxiliaries in the region have hated their treatment for a while. And to make matters worse, the current governor of the Liang province, named Zuo Chang, was siphoning money from the military wages and stealing military supplies to sell. And the reason why he did this was because he had spent a fortune buying this governorship. And if you remember from episode 5, when we first talked about how Emperor Liu Hong priced government jobs, those jobs far away from the capital cost twice as much as if you're taking a similar job within the capital, since you had much more freedom and control when you're away. So Zuo Chang's governorship didn't come cheap, and he wanted return on his investment. So after he got his job, he started siphoning military wages. And those that he didn't take, he passed along to the town lieutenant Leng Zheng to distribute to his troops. And since the money was always short, guess who didn't get paid? Yep, the auxiliary who had to deal with condescending Han commanders, and were often sent to the most dangerous missions on the battlefield, now also weren't getting paid. So of course, they rebelled. And since they were stationed right next to Jin Cheng, once they took control of the army, they started marching toward that commandery. Now, in the process of this military takeover, the Qiang lieutenant, Leng Zheng, was obviously killed off first. But many other Han commanders were spared and taken as hostages. And these hostages included Bian Zhang and Han Sui, except at the time, their names were actually different, as they changed their names later on for a reason that we will get to pretty soon. So that our story stays straight, let me just give you guys the names they had before they changed it. Bian Zhang, before he changed his name, was called Bian Yun, and Han Sui, before he changed his name, was called Han Yue. And both of them were Han commanders that were taken as hostage and tied up as the army marched towards Jin Cheng. And once they arrived, the administrator of Jin Cheng, whose name was Chen Yi, felt that this rebellion was more of an internal issue than an actual rebel group because the issue stemmed from wage dispute. So he felt like he could resolve this by negotiating, so he rode out to the rebel encampment hoping to talk. But Beigong Bo Yu was not interested in talking this out, and he simply killed Chen Yi once he arrived. Then he used Chen Yi's death to frame Bian Yun and Han Yue, and basically told them that Chen Yi's death is now on your hands too, and you can either join us or die. That because the Han government isn't going to take you back or believe you, even if we release you now. So after some consideration, Bian Yun and Han Yue decided to rebel as well, and Beigong Bo Yu, who had served under Bian Yun as auxiliary, even nominated him to lead them all once again. So at this time, to protect their families and relatives who still lived within the Han territories, both Bian Yun and Han Yue changed their names, and that's how they became Bian Zhang and Han Sui. So in the game that starts in the year 182, the names Bian Zhang and Han Sui will be incorrect since they technically didn't change their name until the winter season of 184, nor did they start out in the position that they started out in. Han Sui more closely matched his position. Bian Zhang is just completely wrong, but we're not going to mind too much about that as they are at least included in the game. So back to our story as Bian Zhang now led the men and easily took down the commander of Jin Cheng since the administrator is now dead. Then they started marching towards the capital commandery of Hanyang, hoping to take out the vile governor Zuo Chang. And in Zuo Chang's defense was the administrator of Hanyang, whose name is Gai Xun. So before we go on, once again, a little pause because I need to voice my frustration out a little bit. Gai Xun is not in the game Total War Three Kingdoms. He's not there at all. And I even used a character finder mod to try to look for him, but I can't. So it's a real shame because he plays a very pivotal role, not only during the Liang Rebellion, but he also comes into play for the story of Dong Zhuo and Yuan Shao later on down the line too. So please just get used to seeing this box with his name in it. Now Gai Xun and Zuo Chang actually didn't get along, as Gai Xun was like Lu Zhi, and was the incorruptible servant of the Han Dynasty, and looked down on corrupt officials like Zuo Chang, who bought their jobs. But as the administrator of Hanyang, he knew he was responsible to defend it. And in comparison, Zuo Chang, who was the governor of the whole province, had actually decided to evacuate himself away from this capital commandery as the rebel forces neared, as he escaped east with most of his guards, and thus weakening 
Gai Xuan's defense. And in his mind, he had hoped the rebel would actually kill off Gai Xuan, as Gai Xuan was always writing these reports to the imperial court, reporting on his corrupt ways. But Gai Xuan didn't fall, and not only did he hold, he beat back the rebels all the way to Jincheng. However, rebels only lost the battle and not the war, as their ranks continued to grow, as they were able to rally many of the Qiang tribes to their cause, and by the early month of 185, they launched a new assault farther north against the newly appointed Qiang lieutenant Xia Yu, who had once served under Duan Zhong. So it wasn't very hard to gather Qiang tribes to go after him. Now under siege, Xia Yu asked the central government for help. But with winter conditions on the road, the Han forces would not be able to make it in time. So when all hope seemed lost, Gai Xun once again marched his feeble force of less than a thousand men out of Hanyang to give their best attempt to rescue Xia Yu, who is technically his superior. But the odds were too overwhelming, and after their first attempt to break the siege, Gai Xun's force was down to less than a hundred men. Now, since Gai Xun is the rare breed of incorruptible administrators, many Qiang tribal men and the Han commanders like Bian Zhang really liked him and didn't want to see him die and pleaded with him on the battlefield to retreat back to Hanyang. But Gai Xun ignored their pleas and instead organized his men for a final assault. And he pointed at a nearby tree, telling the rebels to please bury him under that tree after he dies. And then he charged. But he did not die as Bian Zhang ordered his men to not kill him, as they countered the feeble charge attempt and slaughtered everyone but Gai Xun, who they had to tie up and send back to Hanyang by force to make sure he didn't take his own life there. But with that, Xia Yu's time was also up, as they were able to kill him off and take control of the northern part of the Liang province. So up until now, the Han response has been largely non-existent. As many a court had hoped that the Liang situation would be able to resolve itself, like many times in the past, so they merely swapped governors in 185 and ordered Huang Fusong at the same time to move his force west to Chang'an, just outside of the Liang province, in case things got out of hand. And the new governor they sent in to replace the corrupt Zuo Chang is a man named Song Xiao, who was a famous Confucian scholar who wholeheartedly believe that the Liang province was always rebellion because the people there were savages and uneducated. And if he could simply teach them poetry and classical literature, then it would be all resolved. So literally the first thing he did after taking office was to write a report back to the capital asking for thousands of copies of books on poetry so he can teach the locals. And you can just imagine Gai Xun going crazy in the background. Well, the good news is that once the imperial court got this report, they were not insane, and they responded by firing him right away and replacing him with a new governor named Yang Yong, who had bought this job, and in turn started to siphon grains to sell to recruit his investment, which led to a massive famine in the Liang Rebellion in 185, and during this famine, Gai Xun once again did the heroic thing as he opened up his private silos and used his wealth to open food banks to help save thousands of lives as Yang Yong was promptly fired for his corrupt ways. Then finally, the imperial court sent in some real help by sending the young and brash Fu Xie to be the new governor, and this time they even sent an army with him. But after spending some time around Fu Xie, Gai Xun started to notice that Fu Xie's men were just as corrupt as the revolving door of Liang governors spun and spun. So seeing no hope, he finally decided to resign from his post to go home. And although we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here, but in the near future, Fu Xie and Ma Teng would have a showdown against Han Sui, which results in the death of Fu Xie and the surrender of Ma Teng. But this is going to be a story for next episode. So to find out how we get there and how eventually Han Sui and Ma Teng becomes best friends and governors for the Han Empire, come back next time as we'll continue with the Liang Rebellion. Bye!